Welcome to WCW Blunder Season 2, officially known as Super Blunder 2 Turbo. I'd like to say backed by popular demand, but really I just like laughing at mistakes made by multi-million dollar media organizations. Every week I watch Raw and Nitro for the sake of YouTube videos in an effort to cover the entire Monday Night War from start to end, and I've reached the point where Sting becomes WCW president after dethroning former president Ric Flair. For out Flair's presidency, I kept saying to myself, man, this would make for a really good episode of Blunder. Not because the premise is necessarily bad, but just because of how it exemplifies WCW beginning storylines with absolutely no idea where it's gonna go. It's a storyline that starts off fairly typical and there's a good amount of intrigue from the get-go, but WCW didn't bother writing a middle nor an end to most of their angles and the whole thing just evolves into an absolute mess filled with babyface and heel turns alliances that don't make sense, nepotism that does not pay off at all, and the president himself going absolutely mental. Today we're going to check out the whole storyline and anytime something dumb happens I'll give it a blunder point. This'll let us see exactly how many times this storyline went off the rails. When Flair came back in the summer of 1998 after being fired by Eric Bischoff, we were given one of the greatest promos in Nitro history. It's probably my favourite Nitro promo of all time, actually. Rick spoke from the heart when he called Bischoff a liar and a scam artist, and WCW really had something special here in terms of building up a brand new storyline that was deeply based in reality. One week after this promo, Bischoff informed Rick that he was not going to wrestle on WCW programming ever again. The best way to make Flair rot away was to not use him as a pro wrestler, and Flair would call this an abuse of power. Keep that in mind by the way, abuse of power, because Flair would become everything he claimed Bischoff was and more. With the reunited four horsemen in the ring, Flair said he would never answer to a company president who wore sneakers and jeans when going to work, but Rick didn't really have a choice. Bischoff would abuse his power to get Flair and the horsemen kicked out of arenas, and on one particular week where Bischoff claimed Rick wasn't in attendance, Arn Anderson surprised Eric by saying that Flair actually was in the building. Only, it wasn't Rick Flair, it was his young son Reed. Not only was Reed in attendance, David Flair was also in the building watching from the audience, and Bischoff got embarrassed when the youngest Flair boy took him down twice in the middle of the ring. This is going to be blunder point number one, because if a kid could whip Bischoff's ass, then what hope did he have going up against a legend like nature boy Ric Flair? Rick would then use his friends in high places to gain access to arenas, and he even had the mayor of Minneapolis named 19th of October 1998 Rick Flair Day so he could get one over on Eric. However, Eric would counter this by still refusing to let Flair wrestle on TV. On the first hour of Nitro, on the 26th of October 1998, Bischoff announced to Flair and the world that it was time to let bygones be bygones because the people want to see Flair compete again. He promised Rick a match later on in the show, but instead a rerun of Hulk Hogan vs Flair at Bash at the Beach 1994 was played, so that's blunder point number two. This was a clear bait and switch from WCW, and while some will say it played well into Eric's dickish character, I don't care. Something was advertised that the company had no intention on delivering on. They did this the following week too, showing clips of Flair vs Hogan at Halloween Havoc 1994, though to be fair, there wasn't a Flair match advertised for this particular show. Flair offered Bischoff a match and Eric said he'd accept this match if one of the horsemen could beat Barry Windham. Windham had turned on Rick a week prior. Thanks to special referee Dusty Rhodes, Dean Malenko won the match and Bischoff was set to face Slick Rick at Starcade 98. Bischoff, however, still fancied his chances. Two weeks later, he called Flair old while saying WCW's look into the new millennium and it's all about the future, and to show everyone how old Ric Flair was and why the nature boy was yesterday's news, WCW decided that Rick should have a heart attack in the middle of the ring. This is blunder number three and easily one of the biggest blunders we'll see in this video. I could go on all day about how this was a bad idea, but you don't need to be a brain surgeon to work it out for yourself. But for the many people who use pro wrestling as an escape from the harsh realities of real life, this was, of course, seen as something done in bad taste. WCW also bottled it when the negative feedback came pouring in, they said Flair was actually poisoned and he in fact didn't suffer a heart attack. Eric said on TV he had nothing to do with what happened to Flair and the whole thing was completely forgotten about, it was never mentioned again. 
You can see the train of thought here, though. In a kayfabe sense, Eric Bischoff wanted to stand a chance against Flair, so they needed to put Rick at some kind of disadvantage. But fuck me, they took it to a pretty extreme and harsh level right here, and it did not pay off. Anyway, on the same week that Flair collapsed in the ring, Eric beat up the Nature Boy's kids on Thunder and he kissed Ric Flair's wife. This made all of Ric's health problems go away, and Bischoff just made it personal before the big match at Starcade. So, what happens on WCW's biggest show of the year? Did Ric Flair get some justice for this attempted murder and another man forcing himself on his wife? No, he got beat. Kurt Hennig passed Eric Bischoff those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks, but we'll call them brass knucks anyway, and Flair got knocked out. Eric Bischoff defeated Ric Flair at a Starcade event via pinfall, and the very next night, Flair would end up beating Eric. I know the argument, there's more people watching on Monday nights, but for the sake of legacy and for the sake of the history books, Bischoff beating Ric Flair at Starcade is fucking stupid. Blunder number 4. To get his rematch on Nitro, Rick stripped down to his underwear while throwing his clothes into the crowd. He then handcuffed himself to the top rope and he demanded a clause be written into the match contract. If Flair beat Bischoff in the Nitro main event, he had also become the new president of WCW. Bischoff would no longer be able to abuse his power and Rick would be in control. By the way, I'm not giving this a blunder point. Flair stripping down and handcuffing himself to the ring ropes was hilarious, so this gets a pass from me. Instead of having Flair arrested though, Bischoff agrees to the match and Flair ends up beating Easy e in the Nitro main event. Flair was now president of the company and that means he had the ability to book every match that happens in WCW. The next week, on the infamous January 4th, 1999 episode of Nitro, new WCW president Ric Flair would force Eric Bischoff onto the commentary team. This would be a running theme for the next month or so, where Flair would get Bischoff to do jobs that Eric felt were beneath him. And this brings us to blunder number 5, because almost every time Eric was given a job to do, it would always backfire on Rick. yet Rick kept giving Bischoff more jobs and giving Eric more opportunities to screw him over. For example, Bischoff was made to sell merchandise at the concession stands, so he snuck a weapon inside a foam finger that benefited the NWO in a Nitro main event. Another time, he had to set up the ring and he was able to leave a wrench behind for the NWO to use during another main event. And when Bischoff was forced to clean the restrooms, he had the opportunity to give Hogan a bucket filled with bleach. The absolute worst backfire was when Flair made Bischoff his limousine driver and Eric drove the WCW president right into an NWO ambush. You could see it coming a mile off, so in the end, Easy e got the better of Rick almost every time he was made to do something against his will. The idea of Eric doing these jobs was good, but it also backfired on the president time and time again, making Rick look dumb each and every week. Flair was also, in storyline, responsible for booking the infamous finger poke of doom match, so that's blunder number 6. And Flair also used his newfound status to book himself in a handicap match against Kurt Hennig and Barry Windham at Sold Out. I'm not giving this a blunder point though, because even though he was using his newfound power for his own benefit, he was still at a disadvantage at first, seeing as it was a 2 on 1 match. David Flair wanted to help his dad and turn the match into a regular tag team encounter. Rick eventually agreed. But again, I'm not giving this a blunder point because David's role in the sold out match actually worked out really well. The NWO got involved and Rick ended up getting handcuffed while his son got absolutely destroyed by the faction. It was effective in giving the NWO an edge that they hadn't had for a very long time. And it also created this hopeless environment for Ric Flair and an uncomfortable viewing experience for folks at home. I thought it played out pretty well. Don't worry though, David gets blunder point number 7 for this god awful match against Eric Bischoff that happened the night after the pay per view. At the time of scripting this video, I'm up to August 99 in my rewatch of both WCW Nitro and WWF Raw, and this has been the absolute worst match I've seen on either show during the entire Monday Night War. It's hilariously bad, and David looks like a lost child in the ring. Add in the fact that he's trying to have something that resembles a fight with Eric Bischoff, and you've got yourself an absolute joke that made me cry with laughter when watching it back for Reliving the War. This right here should have told everyone that David Flair was not ready to compete on TV, and if the higher ups were honest with themselves, he may never be ready to compete on TV. But David Flair would get more and more involved in this storyline and things began getting really stupid in no time at all. The 
the abuse of power began the week after the David Flair vs Bischoff match. Ric Flair, president of WCW, booked himself in a world title match for the upcoming Super Brawl 9 pay-per-view against Hollywood Hogan. Blunder number 8, a man running the show shouldn't book himself in world title matches. I know this can be argued for the sake of storyline, but there were others more deserving than Flair during this time period. Another problem was beginning to build in the run up to Super Brawl. The NWO Red and Black were still getting cheered after the finger poke of doom and since Hogan was part of that group, he was beginning to get cheered too. Not by a whole lot mind you, but much more than when he was running the NWO Black and White. Still though, Hogan would stake out young David Flair but Hulk didn't attack Rick's son. No, instead he wanted to set him up with WCW newcomer Tori Wilson. Wilson was gonna seduce David and Rick's kid would be so desperately in love that he'd do whatever Hulk in the NWO wanted him to do. This plan worked and blunder number 9 is having David Flair join the NWO not just because it makes the already watered down group even more uh, watery. But just a few weeks ago this faction beat David like a dog in front of the whole world and all it took for David to turn on his own flesh and blood was a hot woman giving him a little bit of attention. Also during the match Hogan played up to the positive reaction he'd been receiving over the past few weeks. We saw brief moments where the old red and yellow Hogan came back and the crowd popped for it. Hogan clearly wanted to turn babyface again so that means Rick would need to eventually turn heel. What did Rick do though to get revenge on his son? How did Slick Rick discipline his kid for embarrassing the Flair name to a worldwide audience? Nothing, absolutely nothing. He was like, okay, I don't care, as he booked himself in another title match against Hogan on pay per view. And then the wheels were set in motion for the heel turn. Arn Anderson couldn't believe Rick was more focused on the world belt than his own kid. Even Hogan and Kevin Nash made comments about Rick's behaviour which further suggested that Rick was the bad guy here and not Hulk Hogan, even though Hogan and Nash, you know, manipulated David by using Tori Wilson. This manipulation would continue when the NWO tried to use another lady to seduce David, but Flair Jr didn't fall for it and this part of the angle went absolutely nowhere. So the inclusion of Denise right here is blunder number 10. It was a total waste of TV time that happened on an episode of Nitro that didn't feature any pro wrestling for the first 60 minutes. If you're going to neglect pro wrestling for storyline progression, make sure the storyline, you know, actually progresses. Speaking of neglect, remember too that Flair was part of the Four Horsemen and it seemed like Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit were the last people on Flair's mind even though they were so important to him during his return a few months prior. Flair started making bad decisions and he was acting more and more eccentric as the weeks went on, but his focus on the belt along with the ignorance showed towards his son actually paid off for Rick when he beat Hogan for the belt at Uncensored 99. This was, without a doubt, one of the most confusing first blood matches you'll ever see in your life. There was some really dodgy officiating from Charles Robinson, it was billed as a first blood match but it still ended via pinfall, and it had that typical Hulk Hogan, he beat me but he didn't really beat me indecisive bullshit to go along with it, but Flair did beat Hogan. This victory also meant that Flair would be WCW president for life, but keep in mind Hogan wrestled this match as a babyface and Flair's victory didn't necessarily blow the roof off the arena the way it could have, had this storyline been a bit more straightforward. Flair returning in the summer of 98 to finally overthrow the evil NWO Hollywood Hogan for the world title should have been a landmark occasion for world championship wrestling, but for reasons already explained in this video, this simply wasn't the case. The whole uncensored 99 first blood match is blunder number 11, an absolute mess of a match right here on pay per view. It's quickly established that Ric Flair is now a heel and Charles Robinson was in Flair's pocket. Rick abused his power on the spring break Nitro by offering everyone a chance to face the world champion in the Nitro main event, but he screwed big name players out of the opportunity by holding a lottery that only involved mid carters. Flair would do everything he could to hold on to the championship and, you know, as a heel this is absolutely fine. Problems arise when he starts giving weird opportunities that don't benefit him as champion and the balance gets offset for no reason. He made a deal with Kevin Nash, one of the key members of the NWO who made Flair's life a living hell from mid 1996 right up until this very point. So Flair siding with NWO members after everything that happened is blunder number 12. The deal was for Kevin to cause a DQ finish during a world title defence and in return Flair would give Kev a world title shot the night after Spring Stampede. 
DDP would end up winning the belt at the pay-per-view in a four-way match, Randy Savage screwed Ric Flair at the end of the bout, Hogan would also get injured during this match, and WCW completely shit themselves because the minimal amount of forward thinking that was put into this storyline got flushed down the toilet when Hollywood injured his knee. So things were changed, rearranged and completely discarded in the weeks following Spring Stampede. Rick refused to reinstate Macho Man Randy Savage as an active competitor after what Randy did at the pay-per-view, so Macho threw out a challenge. If Gorgeous George could beat Charles Robinson in a one-on-one -on -one match at Slambury, then Randy would get officially reinstated by Flair and WCW. Why Flair would agree to this is anyone's guess. You have to remember that throughout all of this, Flair had the power to say no to practically anything that could have caused him problems, but Rick agreed and the match was booked for the pay-per-view. In the meantime, Flair would have an even bigger problem than Randy Savage though. WCW Commissioner Roddy Piper made his return on the March 19th episode of Nitro, and thanks to David Flair signing some papers, the hot rod had Flair sectioned. Yes, due to decisions he made as president of a pro wrestling company, the legendary Ric Flair was getting put in a mental institute because it was apparently the only place that would set him straight. Not Harvey Schiller's office, not even Ted Turner's office, a mental institute. While Rick was supposed to be getting help, Charles Robinson was made president of WCW, Flair gave Charles orders via telephone, and he resumed his duties the following week while bringing some friends from the Mental Institute and Nitro with him. This whole thing is blunder number 13. Blunder number 14, Rick Flair forgives David for turning his back on him and joining the NWO. David just randomly leaves the NWO after all that work put into the Tory Wilson angle, and Rick just completely erases Super Brawl 9 from his memory. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now to be fair, Rick tried to mess with David a little by booking him in difficult matches, but this too was completely forgotten about and the father and son ended up reunited. At Slambury, Rick wrestled Roddy Piper for control of WCW. Flair won the match, but afterwards Eric Bischoff came out to reverse the decision. You need to keep in mind that when Flair beat Bischoff for the presidency, that meant that Bischoff had absolutely no power in WCW from a kayfabe aspect, so Bischoff had no authority to come out and change the outcome of a match like this. Piper fired Flair immediately after the match, but it didn't matter because on the next episode of Nitro, Flair was back in the president role as if not had happened. So that's blunder number 15. The slambery match might as well never have happened because it led to nothing. I have absolutely no idea why they reverted back after selling a pay-per-view match with this pretty big stipulation, but it was WCW in mid-1999 and this company was seriously struggling to maintain logical sense in their storylines. The Gorgeous George vs Charles Robinson match stole the show at Slambury by the way. The event was terrible, but at least these two provided some entertainment. Flair would align himself with DDP and eventually the rest of the Jersey Triad. Remember, it was DDP who took the world belt away from Flair at Spring Stampede, but that doesn't matter, right? Rick would also start giving his son easy wins on Nitro. The Nature Boy even promised Buddy Lee Parker a comfy office job if he lost to David and Rick didn't live up to his word. For those of you who have never experienced a David Flair match during this time period, then I highly recommend you check them out. They're so bad that they're good. Flair and Piper would continue button heads over the presidency and control of World Championship Wrestling, and while all this was going on, some of the younger talent on the roster were getting tired of not getting opportunities in the company. So good guy Roddy Piper looked to Buff Bagwell as someone he wanted to push if Buff could prove himself, and if Roddy Piper could become president. Since Flair aligned himself with DDP and while Paige and Bigelow were doing Flair's dirty work while getting themselves title shots, Benoit and Malenko got fed up with the leader of the Four Horsemen. They told Arn Anderson that Flair was only in it for himself and he didn't care about looking after any of the other horsemen. So Dean and Chris ended up siding with Roddy Piper and the faction was no more. Blunder 16 is the Four Horsemen breaking up for the sake of this storyline. The whole final run of the Horsemen was a complete blunder and it gets even more ridiculous when you see what blunder 17 is. So, a rematch gets booked for the Great American Bosch, Flair vs Piper once again for control of WCW because their previous match didn't count or something, I don't know. And after another terrible match, Ric Flair wins when Buff Bagwell interferes. Arn Anderson was helping Flair throughout the whole match, so Bagwell was only doing what he thought was right. After the match, Roddy Piper attacks Buff Bagwell, and Roddy Piper turns heel to align himself with Ric Flair. 
This is blunder number 17. The horseman broke up to stand beside Roddy Piper, and here's Piper now standing beside Flair. Piper had Rick put in a mental institute, and here he is standing beside Flair. Piper was on the receiving end of attacks from DDP and Bigelow because of Rick, and here he is standing beside Flair. Weeks and weeks of storyline pissed down the toilet, Roddy Piper was now vice president of WCW, and now the storyline was going to center around Flair and Piper stopping young talent from getting a break in the company. During this time, Macho Man Randy Savage would align himself with Flair and do remember, it was Macho who cost Rick the world title back at Spring Stampede. So as you can tell, logic has been completely thrown out the window and there's been no long term planning here. It's a fucking mess and no wonder WCW's viewership was dwindling more and more with each passing week. You couldn't keep up with the constant changes being made from one show to the next. Blunder number 18, David Flair becomes US Champion. Rick booked his son in a world title match on the June 28th 1999 episode of Nitro against Kevin Nash. Yes, the same Kevin Nash who Flair once struck a deal with which effectively caused issues within the NWO. And because the finish was inconclusive and because Rick thought David had Nash beat at one point, he bestowed upon him the vacant United States belt the following week. David could not wrestle, as much as he'd try he just wasn't good and his mic skills were also very poor. David getting handed this championship and having extremely bad matches that always ended due to interference could be a blunder episode on its own, but honestly it's probably the biggest misstep WCW ever took when it comes to their United States Championship, easily one of the worst champions in company history. I know it was done for heat, but it was 100% the wrong type of heat and it did nothing to help WCW or David Flair. At Bosch at the Beach, David beat Dean Malenko while Buff Bagwell beat Roddy Piper in an awful boxing match, putting a stop to that particular storyline and causing Piper to disappear from TV for a little while as he usually did. And the presidency finally ended when Flair began a short feud with long term rival Sting. A match took place on Nitro and if Sting won he had taken control of WCW and Eric Bischoff, who I remember mind you has no power in WCW from a kayfabe standpoint, got in the ring to call for the bell when Flair got put in the Scorpion Deathlock. So after 18 blunders in total throughout this whole time period, one of Ric Flair's worst WCW storylines comes to an end. The President Ric Flair storyline serves as an example of the sheer turmoil and chaos going on backstage in WCW. The inconsistency of the storyline was all over the place and you can tell there was no long term game plan. If there was a game plan then small bumps in the road caused WCW to veer way off track and maybe more mistakes were made while WCW were trying to get back on track. This is but one angle that suffered from WCW's inability to keep things coherent during 1999 though. The thing is, it stands out in people's minds because it was the main TV storyline for quite a long stretch and when you actually put it all together and look at it on a week to week basis, you can't help but marvel at how downright bad it was. The premise was good, having someone overthrow Eric Bischoff and having it be a WCW legend was not a bad idea, it was actually a pretty good idea, but you really need to think about the start, middle and end while always having a backup plan should someone get injured or if something else goes wrong. So 18 blunders in total throughout this whole storyline, it really was a super turbo edition of WCW blunder. Now that the series has started up again, let me know what you'd like to see covered in future blunder episodes. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all soon for season 2 episode 2. Take care.